far over to you, Aida. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. I hope you can hear well and I hope my internet holds. <laughs> I'm a little bit in a small place, so hopefully it's okay. So today I wanted to uh, briefly talk, um, thanks Alexander for a little bit depressing talk, but I think we just need to face the reality, right? So um, my talk is a little bit different. It's about how local people perceive uh, forest benefits or what we call sometimes ecosystem services in Africa. And I've been working, I work at the interface between natural and social sciences. And I think we have a lot of natural scientists in the room, very famous ones. So I'll just try to complement with a little bit of my social science work. So as we all know, ecosystem services are the benefits that ecosystems gives humans. And I really like this definition by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that says that it makes human life not just possible, but also worth living. So remember that maybe the making life worth living is what makes us humans instead of just animals in a certain way. So it's about well-being as well. So usually ecosystem services are grouped into four categories, the provisioning services like material benefits like food or water, regulating services that like climate regulation, I'm sure we talk a lot about it in the conference, the supporting services that make other services possible like soil formation and cultural services which on a way, it's everything that is non-material and we don't know what to do with it, we chuck it into that box. And it, it includes things like uh, reflection, recreation, uh, spiritual enrichment and things like that. So just very briefly, I wanted to, to present you today a little bit of a different approach to ecosystem services from forests. So we heard a lot about ecological approach like quantifying in a way how much carbon is out there, for example, or timber an economic approach, so how much money would we make if we were to, to use these ecosystems in a certain way. But I want to focus on socio-cultural approaches, which make stakeholders the focus point of the, of the research in, in, I mean, theory and in practice. So we want to understand how people use and value their forests. I mean, I, I focus on forests, but it could be other ecosystems. And this approach really helps understand these cultural services that are hard to quantify using, for example, economic approaches also understand the interactions between people and nature. And because we engage with the stakeholders, we make the, the assessment more relevant to them, but also for policy, because they kind of more likely to take ownership of the research that has been done. So just very briefly, we all not uh, perceive things on the same way, on a way, including forest ecosystem services. So the way our values related to different things, including the forest are affected by our social context. So for example, our cultural uh, background, our ethnicity or our tribe, our personal characteristics, our income, age, gender, education, where we live, but also our interaction with the other stakeholders and the ecosystem service, sorry, the ecosystems that we are referring to. So there's been quite a bit of research showing that poor people, educated people and people that live next to forests identify more forest ecosystem services. And in a way, it seems logical, right? People that depend on the forest for livelihoods will know probably more uses and they understand the interactions between people and nature better. Educated people like us, that we go to school, we learn about climate change and carbon and all these things. We also identify some services that maybe these local people may not know. And then of course, people that use it in more often, like that live closer to them, will identify more. So just very briefly, I wanted to try to introduce you two case studies. I have probably 10 by now with some colleagues, but I just chose a couple of them for you to get, get an idea of how this works. And the idea is that we have focus group discussions with village elders from different ethnic groups, and we try to understand their relationship with the forests. So sometimes we separate gender, sometimes we don't, uh, depending on <laughs> location, budget, and many things, but just to give you a flavor of how this looks. So the first case study actually comes from here where I am in Eastern Congo. I'm next to Kauzi Biega. And this area is a national park that is a mountain forest. And it's mostly inhabited by two groups of people, farmers of Bantu origin, and they have different tribes there. You can see a photo, uh, the top right one, and you can already anticipate that these farmers will be using, for example, bamboo to make their houses as you see in the picture. And the second group is hunter gatherers. Uh, sadly, they're now excluded from the park. So they're living outside, but traditionally, and even sometimes illegally, they still enter the forest to go hunting because this is, this is the main source of food for them, even nowadays, and also as a source of income when they sell this bushmeat to other people. 
So you can already see that uh, for most groups, that they'll, they'll interact with the forest a little bit different because of their different cultures, but also their different livelihood strategies. So just very briefly, I'll, I'll show you the results. So the first point is that both hunter gatherers and farmer groups identify many forest ecosystem services, firewood, caterpillars, bushmeat, mushroom water, space for ceremonies, climate regulation, air purification, but also that they're, so as you see, it's not just provisioning, but also regulating and cultural services. And also there's some differences across group. So for example, the she uh, farmers were the only ones to identify fodder because for them cows are important in their culture. So feeding their cows would be important. And sometimes they do that in the forest. But the hunter gatherers identify, for example, many more food items from the forest that the other uh, any groups don't eat. And when we ask them to rank which is the priority, which is the most important thing you get from the forest, it was a very clear dichotomy. For the hunter gatherers was food, the bushmeat and honey, but for the farmer groups, it was microclimate regulation. And I'm sure many of you are wondering, do really uneducated farmers from a remote area in the world talk about microclimate regulation? So actually, of course, they don't use this term, they're just, but they have an understanding of the process, how having good, nice, healthy forests in the mountains makes them have good rainfall, which of course is very important for them to have good yields in their crops. So although they use a different word, they understand the process. And as you see, it's not just about provisioning and material benefits, they also understand these interactions, a bit more of the ecology in a bigger picture, if we put it like that. And very, very briefly, I wanted to explain a little concept that we call place attachment. So place attachment is the emotional bond between a person or a community or a village and a particular place. And I guess most of us in this uh, room or in the room where you are guys are, are quite concerned when trees are cut down, right? I mean, but if a tree is cut down somewhere in Scotland or maybe in Russia, we care a little bit less than if they are, the tree that was being cut down was the only tree we have in our garden where our children are playing or where we used to play when we were children. So this is a bit to, to show that people get attached to certain places or certain habitats or in a way certain forests more than otherwise. And this um, place attachment was obviously greater for the hunter gatherers. And I'm not, I don't have time to go into details, but I'll just give you some of their quotes and I'll just read one of them loud. So it feels you understand what is the emotional connection with the forest. So the, the, I'm reading the third one on the slide that says the forest is important to my people, to who we are as people. Without the forest, we do not exist. And in a way it makes sense, right? If you are a hunter gatherer, if you don't have a forest to go hunting and gathering and living, it is a little bit difficult, right, to be a hunter gatherer. So you just become a different person or as a community to be, become somebody different. And also a few of the uh, people we interviewed, they also mentioned that the forest was a, like a mother to them. So the, the forest is looking after them and they have the duty of caring back and looking back after her. So this reciprocity, sorry, where we humans, okay, we benefit from nature, but we also have the duty to give back and care back. So in a way, um, if we think about the values of nature that are rather instrumental, so we get benefits from nature, that's more of the ecosystem service approach. How we relate to nature, this place attachment, but also as environmentalists, I think we, we all know in a way, or, or we think that nature has a value for, for being there itself, even if humans don't use. So we can see the different groups of people place themselves a little bit different along this uh, circular axis, if we want to call it. So the hunter-gatherers are more to the right because they relate and they have this uh, culture of giving back to nature, caring for nature, where the farmer groups were a little bit more to the left. And just very briefly, I hope I have time. I'll give you another example from Cameroon. And in this area, as you see in the photos, it's much drier. And here we, we studied farmers and pastoralists using focus, group, focus groups as well. And it was a bit of the same story. There were some uh, forest benefits or ecosystem services that both groups mentioned, but there were some differences. Here, for example, the most important forest benefit for everybody, for every group, either farm or pastoralist was water, but this is a much drier area, right? So we can easily understand that having water is key for survival of humans. But the second most important was different. For the pastoralist, as we may expect, it was fodder for the cows, but for the farmer groups here, it was medicine and honey. And uh, <clears throat> so other, in this case, provisioning services from the forest. So in a way we can see um, that uh, it was a bit different. Sorry, I forgot to mention that the Oku farmers also, 
their identity and their culture makes them care back for, for the forest. So although they're farmers and not hunter gatherers, they still have this culture of caring for what they think is their own forest, their kind of ancestral lands. So not just hunter gatherers have this caring nature as well. So just um, that was my, my very brief presentation, but I just wanted to finish with one slide and I hope you take all a minute to think about it. Is where do you stand? or where scientists stand, and I guess there's different groups of scientists as well, right? Does nature have just an instrumental value? And I guess that's what many politicians and maybe policymakers think. Do we also relate to nature in a certain way? And maybe it's not just all nature, maybe it's just the area where we live or we grow up and we use more often that we feel much more attached and much more caring for. But do we also think that nature has a right to be there and like the nice forests have a right to be there, even if humans were not in this planet? So that is it. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll take them uh, after the others. I just, uh, if you want a copy of the publications I, I didn't have time to share or uh, please send me an email, no problem. Thank you. Thanks, Aida. Extremely interesting uh, and important talk. Um, now we're gonna go back from, from the Congo to uh, Birmingham. Uh, and we have uh, our very own Suzanne Suvanto presenting uh, some work on management in European, across European forests. Actually, I think I have, I have this microphone, so I don't need that one. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is a very cool session in a way that we are on three different continents. So now we are going to Europe. 